A puzzle has the ability to captivate one's mind. As we search for a meaning behind each jagged piece, we are determined to see how it fits into the bigger picture. A clue if you might. Like a puzzle, an unsolved mystery is both striking and daunting, keeping many of us up at night searching for answers. We are often faced questioning how and why. How could someone commit such atrocious acts? And why do they get to walk free? while the victim's family suffers. On today's episode, we'll cover three disturbing unsolved mysteries in hopes of spreading awareness and one day helping solve the mystery. Our first mystery takes us all the way back to 1943. The Second World War was raging through Europe and there was seemingly no end in sight. The people of Britain trotted on, pushing through with true bulldog spirit and taking everything in their stride. On April 18, 1943, four boys who were trespassing in Hagley Wood discovered more than they had bargained for and would kickstart one of England's longest running mysteries. On April 18, Bob Hart, Tom Willits, Fred Payne, and Bob Farmer snuck into Hagley Woods, which sits on the Hagley Hall estate in Hagley Stourbridge. This land belonged to Lord Cobham but that did little to deter the four boys from trespassing to look for bird's eggs. The four teenagers were traversing through the woods, peeking into trees and observing the treetops when they came across a witch helm. Witch helms have a distinctive appearance and the boys knew that if they climbed inside the hollow trunk, they would likely hit the jackpot. But instead of reaching inside and pulling out a handful of eggs, the boys discovered something much worse. As they pulled the object out to look at it, they realized that it was a human skull, with hair still attached to the top. Horrified at what they had found, the boys ran out of the woods, vowing to take their secret to the grave. After all, they had been trespassing on a lord's land and didn't want to get in trouble. The human remains laid there for a little while, but as the hours passed, it began eating away at one of the boys, who eventually told his parents who in turn called the police. Soon after, police had swarmed the witch elm and the investigation had officially begun. As the police dug deeper into the tree, they found an imitation gold ring, crepe soled shoes, and a piece of fabric that had been placed into her mouth. One of her hands was missing and various bones had been scattered around. The coroner was able to determine that the skeleton belonged to a woman around 35 years old with light brown hair and standing around five feet tall. The coroner also determined her cause of death to be suffocation in that the post-mortem index was around 18 months. She had also given birth to one child in her lifetime and had irregular teeth. But as there was no information at the scene, they were unable to make an initial identification. Unfortunately, almost 80 years later, we still do not know her name and she remains a Jane Doe. Working on the angle of her irregular teeth, the coroner's court contacted local dentists and began publishing her dental records across the UK in hopes that someone would recognize them. No one came forward. However, Professor Margaret Murray, a professor of anthropology, made a bizarre statement. According to the History Press, Professor Murray stated, Let it be known that this bore all the signs of a black magic execution the hand of glory of an executed person being ritually very powerful, and the body enclosed in the tree would be unable to haunt its murderers. This discovery of the Jane Doe was the talk of Hagley in the surrounding areas. People began calling the police station, wanting to check whether it was their missing loved one. People speculated as to who amongst them could be capable of such a crime, and why anyone would want to do that. The coroner noted that the woman was placed there before rigor mortis set in, and that it would not have been possible for her to put herself in that position. The unknown woman continued to be the talk of the town for a few weeks. However, as the investigation dwindled, the attention fizzled out. Then, one cold December evening, just before Christmas, a strange message appeared on a wall in Birmingham. The message read, Who put Lubella down the witch helm? The residents of Hagley and Birmingham were shocked. 
Was this a cruel practical joke? Or were they being taunted by the unknown woman's killer? As the years went by, the graffiti continued, and the culprit has never been apprehended to this day. The connection to the occult and ritualistic magic was further explored, and as mentioned above, Professor Murray concluded that Bella had been a part of the Hand of Glory ceremony. This new news that Bella had been involved in a ritualistic killing sent the people of Hagley into panic, fearing that they might be the next to fall under a black magic spell. The next update in Bella's case did not come until the early 1950s, when the police reopened Bella's case and appealed for anyone with information to come forward. Now out of the war, the police had more time to focus their attention on investigations such as this, and with the worries of war off their minds, the people of Hagley were more receptive to the investigation. In 1953, editors at the Wolverhampton Express and Star were sorting through their daily post when they came across an odd letter. After carefully opening the envelope, they saw that the letter was addressed to them by a woman calling herself Anna of Claverly. And as the editors skimmed the pages, their faces dropped. According to Anna, the anonymous letter writer, Bella had in fact been a German spy who had parachuted into England in order to gather intelligence about munition factories across Birmingham in the Midlands. Birmingham in the Midlands played a huge role in World War I and II for the British Army, supplying them with munitions, steel, and other equipment and resources. Towns and cities across England were transformed into centers for guns, ammo, tanks, ships, and planes almost overnight, and many of these places still rely on heavy industry to get by. This remained just a theory that was until many years later after Bella was discovered when M15 came forward with some damning information. According to reports that had been reclassified, Joseph Jacobs had been captured and arrested when he was caught parachuting into England, and with him he carried a picture of Clara Bowerly, who was a famous German entertainer at the time. According to Joseph, Clara had been recruited by Nazi officers as a spy and tasked her with gathering intelligence within England. Using her wits and good looks, it was hoped that Clara may have been able to charm high-ranking officers into giving away the army's biggest secrets. However, according to Joseph, Clara was dropped over the West Midlands in 1941 and had since dropped off the map. The coroner had estimated that Bella had been deceased for around 18 months, which takes the date to around October 1941. Is it possible that Clara is Bella? And that she was placed into the tree when someone found out she was a German spy? Or perhaps she was hidden in there by another German officer or spy? In 2018, Carolyn Wilkinson of Dundee University created a facial approximation sketch of what Bella may have looked like in life. Caroline specializes in cranial facial identification and had to use photographs of Bella's skull in order to create an approximation as the skull has unfortunately been lost by the West Midland police. For the first time ever, we have a clear picture of who Bella may have been, and hopefully, that means we are one step closer to justice. If you have any information, you can call 101-0345-113-1. Five thousand, or Crime Stoppers at zero eight zero zero five 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 one one one. On December fourteenth, two thousand fourteen, a teenage boy walking along a country road in Beaver County, Pennsylvania, made a discovery that would forever change the trajectory of his life. As he made his way along the road, leaves crunching underneath his feet. He spotted something in the woods. During the approach, he realized that what he had found was the embalmed head of an adult woman. Her eyes were closed, but her mouth was wide open, almost as if she was trying to speak. The teenage boy took a few steps back, pulled out his phone, and calmly dialed 911. He then told the operator, I found a human head. 
and within minutes, the Economy Bureau police had arrived at the scene. The area was cordoned off, and the police officially opened their investigation. The woman's head was transported to the coroner's office for further inspection, and in the report, the coroner noted that the head had been severed with surgical precision, and that whoever was responsible had extensive anatomical knowledge. The coroner also discovered that the woman's eyes had been held shut using eye caps, a common technique in the mortuary and funeral industry. As they peeled back the caps, they expected to see two glassy eyes staring back at them. Instead, they were greeted by two red rubber balls. This is not an industry standard and it completely threw off the coroner and investigators. It was also found that the woman had undergone extensive dental work and that some of the work had been performed after 2004 based on compounds that were not available before then. X-rays of her teeth were taken and distributed to dental journals across the US but no one seemed to recognize her. Her face was in a recognizable condition and forensic artist Michelle Vitelli, who is also an anatomy professor, was called in to help the Economy Bureau Police make an approximation sketch. Michelle told Reuters, When we lifted the flap at the back of the neck, we could see that the whole purpose of that was to access the key joint that would preserve both the head and the vertebral column, thereby maximizing the profitability of both. This is not just anybody going in with a kitchen knife or anything remotely like that. It was well done and it was placed perfectly. After examining the head, Michelle, the coroner, and investigators came to the conclusion that the woman may have been killed as part of the black market organ trade. According to one body broker, human heads can sell for around $300 and other organs such as hearts, livers, kidneys, lungs, and eyes go for much higher. The black market organ trade is alive and well and is incredibly popular especially given the high demand for organs for transplant across the world. So if this woman was a victim of the organ trade, why was her head left behind? This is the most identifiable piece of her, so why was it carelessly tossed along a country road in Pennsylvania? Perhaps the body brokers had no use for her head. Or perhaps she was not a victim of the organ trade at all. There are so many uncertainties in this case and the biggest uncertainty is her name. Authorities have taken to calling her the Beaver County Jane Doe, but it's about time that she got her real name back. According to an article written for writers, forensic experts have performed isotope testing on Jane Doe and discovered that she did not live in Beaver County prior to her passing. Experts also discovered that she had traces of medication used to treat heart failure in her system and that paramedics may have attempted to revive her shortly before her passing. Almost eight years has passed since the Beaver County Jane Doe was discovered and now the Economy Borough Police Department needs your help to identify her. The woman is described as white, 40 to 80 years old, with gray, partially gray hair. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Economy Borough Police Department at 724-869-7877, quoting case number 14-003-408. On November 10th, 1985, a hunter making his way through Bear Brook State Park in Allentown, New Hampshire, made a gruesome discovery that would send authorities on a decade-long hunt for justice. As he was walking through the forest, he came across what used to be a store and found a large 55-gallon metal drum. It appears that curiosity got the better of him, and as he peeled open the lid, he found two bodies stuffed inside. One of the bodies belonged to an adult woman, and the other belonged to a female child. In 1985, DNA testing was in its infancy and investigators were not able to establish a familial link between the two. It wouldn't be until many years later that forensic experts would establish that the older woman was the mother of the child found with her and another child found in the same area. The investigation continued into the 1990s but without so much of a name 
the police quickly found themselves at a dead end. They scoured through missing persons reports but found no matches. The investigation found itself at somewhat of a standstill. That was until May 2000 when another 55 gallon metal drum was found in the same area. It had been concealed by leaves, foliage, and brush, but examination showed that the two bodies inside had been there for just as long as the two discovered in 1985. Somehow, the police had missed this barrel during their search of the area. Inside the drums were the remains of two girls, one aged between two and four, and the other between one and three years old. Now with four bodies, investigators worked harder than ever to piece together the clues of this case. There are lots of small details surrounding this case, and there is a wealth of information available online about this case. Whilst most of the work happened behind closed doors, investigators did release small tidbits of information. After testing DNA from the middle child, investigators found a paternal connection to a man named Robert Evans, who passed away in 2010, whilst he was serving a sentence for a 2002 murder of his wife. This is where the evidence begins to come together. You see, Robert Evans wasn't his real name, and it wasn't until years later that police learned that Robert Evans was actually Terry Peter Rasmussen. Rasmussen had a criminal past and had killed his wife in 2002, and when three of the four victims were identified, the police were certain that they had found their man. The youngest and the oldest child, along with the adult female, were identified in 2019, and a familial link was found between them all, putting an end to that part of the Bear Brook mystery. Thanks to advances in DNA and investigative techniques, three of the four bodies were identified as Marlies Honeychurch, Marie Elizabeth Vaughn, and Sarah Lynn McWaters. But unfortunately, the middle child has remained unidentified and unnamed for all of these years. Marlies, Marie, and Sarah were last seen in La Puente, California in late 1978, and at the time, Marlies was in a relationship with none other than Terry Rasmussen. According to Paula Hodges, Marlies's sister, I don't remember exactly what happened, I just heard that they had an argument. Marlies and my mom. My mom might have said something to her as, he's too old for you, why are you with him? She went with Terry and they left, never called, never contacted nobody, just disappeared. Whilst this part of the mystery has been solved, there is still an unidentified child that needs our help. The middle child is described as a white female with slight Asian, African, and Native American heritage, brown hair, and around 3 foot 3 inches to 3 foot 9 inches tall. She was possibly anemic and had a noticeable overbite. It was determined that her biological father was Terry Peter Rasmussen, and on her Doe Network profile, it states, Isotope tests on this child's remains indicated that she was not originally from New Hampshire, and likely only spent a few weeks or months in the New Hampshire region before her death. In viewing the timeline for Rasmussen, it appears most likely that this descendant was born in Texas, possibly on the Gulf Coast if Rasmussen was working on an oil rig at the time. Ongoing genealogy efforts have revealed that the descendant's mother's relatives may have come from Pearl River County, Mississippi. Anyone with information about the middle child Jane Doe of the Bear Brook murders is asked to contact the following agencies. The New Hampshire State Medical Examiner's Office at 603-271-1235, quoting case number 103-00. The New Hampshire State Police at 603-223-3856, quoting the case number 00-074, FBI's VICAP at 800-634-4097. That is it for this one. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, please like, share, and subscribe. This will help my channel grow. If you have a future story suggestion or would like to contact me directly, you can do so by emailing me at creepyunsolvedmedia at gmail.com. Looking for more content? Be sure to visit creepyunsolved.com. 
where you'll find podcast episodes, YouTube videos, and the Creepy Unsolved blog. Until next time, this is Dylan signing off. I look forward to your comments below. Your comments below. Your comments below.